Parshas Tetzave has 101 verses and 7 mitzvos, and it's going to be a continuation of the theme of last week. Last week we read a litany of instructions related to creating a tabernacle, a mishkan, a portable sanctuary for God to dwell in. Whereas last week's focus was primarily on the edifice itself and the vessels, this week we're going to learn about one more of the vessels, but primarily it's going to be oriented around the construction of the special garments of the priests that they wore in the temple, in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle. And we're also going to read about what happens once we're done. We have all these instructions about what to do and what to build, and we're going to get the next set of instructions. Once it's built, how do we inaugurate it? And in addition, we're also going to be told a little bit about what happens on an ongoing basis in the Mishnah, in the tabernacle, and subsequently in the temple. Now, all the commentaries point out that there is an unusual oddity in this week's Parsha, in that the name Moshe, the name Moses, does not appear even once. And this is the only time since the introduction of Moshe in the beginning of Exodus, in chapter 2, until really the end of the Torah. The end of the Torah is the death and the burial and the eulogy of Moses. In every Parsha, Moses' name appears. Whereas in this Parsha, essentially the entire Parsha is a dialogue between the Almighty and Moses, and the Torah seemingly went out of its way to deliberately omit Moshe's name. So many of the commentaries talk about that. Uh, So some of them say, quite interestingly, we know that Moses died on the seventh day of Adar. And every year, that date in the calendar falls out during this week's Parsha. And that's sort of speak hinting at the fact that Moses is gone. Moses is gone because he went to the upper spheres, he passed away, and therefore that's kind of hinted in the fact that he's missing from the Parsha. And one of the commentaries add that we know, even though Moshe was the greatest Jew and in fact the greatest human that ever lives, none of us, not in the Torah, not subsequently, ever thought of deifying him. And in fact, even though this is the day that he passed to the upper spheres, specifically the Torah goes out of its way to omit his name, to reduce the likelihood or to at least exhibit the fact that even when he passes, we're not going to give off the impression that he's anything more than a man. Of course, he's the greatest man that ever lives. He became like an angel, but he's a man, a creation of God nonetheless. That's one of the answers. A second answer is that the reason why Moshe does not appear in this week's Parsha is that in next week's Parsha, Parsha's Kisisa, one of the most dramatic interaction that happens between Moshe and God, after the episode of the golden calf, God threatens to destroy the Jewish people, to kill them all and start from scratch with Moses as the father of the new nation. And Moses tells God, if you go ahead and you want to get rid of the Jews, get rid of me too. And he tells God, erase me from your book that you have written. Erase me from the Torah. If you're not going to let the Jews prevail, erase me from your book. And our sages tell us a principle that when a tzaddik, when a righteous person gives a curse, even if the curse is contingent upon a condition and the condition is not met and therefore the curse should not be activated, still when the curse of the tzaddik is given, it is activated. And therefore, there had to be some fulfillment of the fact that Moshe's name is erased. And because that curse, so to speak, happened in next week's parasha, so to speak, every week, subsequently, God pushed it off. He says, no, 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 I'm not going to erase Moshe from this parasha. Let's push it off. Let's kick the can down the road. Until 54 weeks later, it got back, so to speak, to the parasha preceding there's no other option. You can't kick it any further. And therefore, in this parsha, parsha Tetzave, the last parsha, or the parsha right before the curse that Moshe gave to himself, so to speak, to be erased from the book, Moshe's name had to be omitted. A third answer as to why Moshe's name does not appear in the parsha is to remind us of a very important point. And this is similar to what we said a little bit earlier. Moshe, He is the ultimate intermediary between us and God. He's the ultimate prophet, the conduit. He gives us Torah. God speaks to him. He conveys those words accurately 
to us. But, of course, the lines between someone who's very lofty and someone who is very grand and someone who is, or something that is very spiritual, the line between that and God can sometimes get blurred. As Maimonides tells us, the origin of idolatry was the fact that people wanted to accord honor to God by giving honor to his constellations. And therefore, there's always a risk that Moshe can, God forbid, be conflated and viewed as some sort of deity. And therefore, we're reminding ourselves of the fact that Moshe is nothing more than an intermediary. He's a human, a very lofty human, but someone who is a human nonetheless, and he's an intermediary between us and God. And particularly in this Parsha, that the central theme of the Parsha is the Kohanim, the priests, who are also perceived as intermediaries. They do all the work in the temple on behalf of the Jewish people. There is a need to reinforce this point that intermediaries are intermediaries. They're not to be confused or conflated with God himself. So the Parsha begins uh, with an instruction to raise the funds for oil needed for the menorah. We had last week the instruction to build the menorah. And, of course, we had the instruction to raise all the funds, the materials needed for the vessels in the Mishkan. Now we're told to also raise the uh, funds for the oil for lighting the menorah. And we're told when the menorah is lit and where it is lit, it is lit in the tabernacle outside of the partition, not in the Holy of Holies, but what's known as the Holy and Aaron and the son shall arrange it from evening until morning before Hashem, an eternal decree for the generations from the children of Israel. The commentaries point out that the Parsha begins with a command, with an instruction. You shall command the children of Israel. It doesn't say you should tell them. It kind of adds some strength to the instruction. It's encouraging us, but it's, it's urging us to get the oil to sponsor the oil. And there's a principle the Talmud tells us that when the Torah ups the ante, when the Torah doesn't just tell us, it encourages us, it commands us, it's because there is some resistance. We are predisposed to not necessarily be eager to do this, and the Talmud says because there's a monetary loss. And the explanation perhaps is that it's easier to fundraise, so to speak, for the building, for the construction of the mission itself, but for the daily ongoing operations, that's something that's viewed as it's, it's, it's lost. I'm just putting the money and it's going down a pit. It doesn't, it doesn't actually materialize in anything substantial. And therefore we have to be encouraged to give and we have to be coached and urged to, to give because we're not necessarily predisposed to be as generous. And in fact, as any fundraiser will tell you, it's a lot easier to uh, raise money for something that people think is is lasting, is real, versus the daily operations, people have a harder time to be generous in those areas. Now, the Torah tells us that the oil has to be clean, has to be pure, has to be virgin olive oil. There can be no sediments. It has to be the first squeeze. The first squeeze is pure olive oil. Everything else has some degree of dilution. And it has to be a steady light, an ongoing light. You light it in the evening, uh, Ramban, he tells us that there's one of the candles that's always lit. And uh, Rashi also later on tells us in verse 21 that we have to estimate how much oil is needed. Uh, because the menorah is lit at night and it's supposed to lit till the morning. Well, how much oil do you need? So you have to estimate. And of course, in the winter, the nights are longer. So you need more oil. So our sages tell us that you need a half a log which is a certain measurement of oil. And that's for the longest nights of the year. And therefore, once that is needed for the longest night, you just do that for every night. And therefore, in the summer, it stays lit even into the day, but you don't lose anything as long as it's lit throughout the night. Now, to make this whole idea of lighting the candle menorah a little bit more relevant, it's been said that the oil for the menorah and lighting the kindling of the menorah, of of, of the lamps, of the candelabra, is a model for pedagogy. So, for example, Rashi tells us that the way we light the candle is we take a lit candle and we place it next to the unlit wick. And you keep it there until the 
newly lit wick can illuminate on its own. And my grandfather, blessed memory, used to always say that the model of parenting or really of education in general is that the lit candle of the father, of the parent or of the educator, it's that the touch point of the education is to the degree that the child can flourish on their own. And in addition, just like the oil used for the menorah cannot have any sediments, it's got to be pure, so too we have to be very careful that we don't allow room for misinterpretation for the children to make mistakes. We have to make sure that we, when we provide the educational information and approaches, it should be done properly and we have to be well thought out just like the the olive oil, we can't just drop any oil. We have to be thought out in how we teach our children. And in addition, it's something interesting. It's been pointed out again that you know you have the winter nights and there's longer nights and you need more oil, and then there's the summer nights and then you need less oil. But you give them all the same. You have weaker students, you have weaker children, uh, you have more intelligent, more capable, more gifted children. We number one, cannot assume that the children are going to flourish on their own, even though they have the steels, they have more steels, we have to still hold their hands, we have to still invest whatever it is that we can to ensure that we do a good job in teaching them. But also we can't give up on the weaker students, we can't forfeit, we can't raise our hands up in defeat, we have our responsibilities extend to all kinds of students and all kinds of situations and all kinds of children, we are tasked with the responsibility of doing the best we can to educate them and guide them in a way that they will flourish. Now, chapter 28 begins with the consecration of the priests. Now, you, again, this is Moses. It doesn't say Moses, but God's talking to Moses. Like we said, the entire Parsha is going to be God saying you, 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 and not say Moses' Moses' name at all. Now, you bring near to yourself Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel. I want you to select Aaron and his children. Aaron, Nadav, and Aviu, Elazar, and Isamar. These are the four sons of Aaron, and they're going to be ministers for me. What is happening over here is that God telling Moses that once the Mishnah, once the tabernacle is completed, you are going to take Aaron and his children and you're going to designate them to become Kohanim, to become priests. Now, there's an important backstory here. And that is that Moshe, of course, is the greatest leader that we've had, but even the greatest leader of the time. How come his brother Aaron, he is the one who becomes the Kohen and Moses is not the Kohen? So it's important to know the backstory here. Initially, the plan was that Moses was supposed to be the Kohen, just like he's the king, he's the leader, he's the greatest of his of the brothers, and therefore he's supposed to outshine his brother, his older brother, Aaron. Aaron was really supposed to be the Levite, the standard issue Levite, and Moses was supposed to be the Kohen. However, due to events at the beginning of the book of Exodus, Moses lost his stature of being the Kohen, and Aaron earned it. And that's when God and Moses were having that week-long dialogue. Uh, God wants Moses to go to Egypt to go save the Jews, and Moses is objecting for a whole host of reasons. One of the reasons is he doesn't want to make Aaron upset. He doesn't want to raise the ire and the envy of his brother Aaron. And God responds, Aaron the Levite, he'll be happy. He'll be happy in his heart for you. He does not have even a smidgen of envy. And God gets angry at Moses. And Rashi there tells us, quoting from our sages, that really Aaron at that juncture was the Levite. And he was supposed to remain the Levite. Moses was supposed to be the Kohen. But because Moses did not fully appreciate the greatness of his brother, didn't realize that his brother was the only person that had no envy at all, therefore Moses lost the stature of being the Kohen and Aaron earned it. And therefore, what essentially is happening here at the beginning of chapter 28 is that Moses is going to have to confer to his brother the stature that he had. His replacement, so to speak, as the Kohen, as the high priest, and as the family of the Kohen, the family of the priests, that was really the domain of Moses. And now he's going to have to take his brother and he's going to have to engage essentially in in self-sacrifice and take his brother, nominate him, and hold his hands as he's being coronated as Moses' successor 
as the high priest. And this is maybe a fourth answer as to why Moshe's name was omitted from the Parsha. Moshe, after all, in this Parsha, had a significant demotion. He was a Kohen. And in fact, as we'll read a little bit later on, he's going to be a Kohen for a little bit. But then, once the tabernacle is completed, and after seven days of inauguration, Moses is going to have to transfer that to his brother, and therefore, the Torah omitted his name to avoid rubbing salt in his wounds, and therefore, he is, so to speak, not present when his demotion is being detailed by the Torah. So God tells Moshe, take Aaron and his children, and they're going to be the ministers for me. They're going to be the Kohanim. They're going to be the Kohanes. You shall make vestments of sanctity for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for splendor. The majority of the Parsha is going to be de- outlining the various vestments, the various garments, the various special clothing given to Aaron and his children that when they are ministering, when they're working in the temple. The Ramban explains that these garments are garments of royalty And in fact, he spends a great deal of time detailing uh, with scriptural evidence how each one of the eight vestments, each one of the eight garments of the high priest are garments that are kingly and uh, the high priest is going to have eight. And as we shall soon see, the regular priest, the standard priests are going to have only four. And again, just like we had in last week's Parsha, There's the materials, and then there's the construction assembly of the materials. So too over here, you shall speak to all the wise-hearted people whom I have invested with the spirit of wisdom. They shall make the vestments of Aaron to sanctify him, to minister to me. And then the Torah lists the eight, it's really six out of the eight vestments that are going to be given to the high priest. A breastplate, a choshen, an aphod, which is, we'll see more about that. It's like an apron-like garment, uh, a robe a tunic of box-like knit, which is another kind of robe, a turban, a hat, and a sash. They shall make the vestments of sanctity for Aaron, your brother, and his sons. So these are going to be, like we had last week's Parsha, there's going to be a lot of intricate embroidery and, and weaving of very delicate and very precise components, a lot of gold, a lot of very expensive turquoise purple and scarlet wool, and the Torah is going to spend a great deal of time detailing the exact nature of these garments. Now for us, we're going to try to get a little bit deeper. We're going to try to understand not only what these things are, what they look like, but also what the meaning behind each one of these are. So I think a good place to understand what the meaning behind these vestments are and why the Torah gives so much time and space and detailing how they're made and what they look like, we find it maybe an answer in the Talmud, brought into several places in Zvachim 88 and elsewhere. And the Talmud asks the question, soon we're going to read about sacrifices that were brought in the temple, both on the week of inauguration and the daily sacrifices brought in the temple and the Mishkan and the tabernacle uh, from then onward. And the Talmud asked the question, what is the juxtaposition? What is the meaning behind the Torah first telling us about the garments, the vestments of the priests, and then telling us about the sacrifices? So the Talmud tells us something very interesting. Just like sacrifices provide atonement, so too the garments of the high priest provide atonement. And it lists the eight garments of the high priest. And it tells us each one of them, what precisely, which sins precisely it provided atonement for. And it brings evidence for each one of those assertions. So it's a really interesting idea that the garments themselves provide atonement. Now, there is a midrash that actually gives us a different list. But I think there's a general premise that regardless of which precisely which sin does which garment, does each garment provide atonement for, there's a general idea, I think a mind-blowing idea, and that is that the clothing that the Kohen God, the high priest wears, provide a certain degree of atonement, not just for themselves, but for the entire nation. And I think as we're getting closer to Leviticus, and of course in this is Parsha as well, 
the general idea of sacrifice is what it's important for us to know. The Talmud understands this as a basic uh, axiomatic idea. Sacrifices provide atonement. How exactly that works is a subject we're going to dig into a little bit today uh, in this podcast, but in the future uh, discussions that we have in Leviticus, please God. But here we see that it's not just the sacrifice that provide atonement, it's the clothing of the high priest and the rest of the priests themselves that also provide an atonement. So what could possibly be the idea behind that? So the Maharal suggests a very powerful idea. As we mentioned, these garments are garments of royalty. What happens when the high priest, who's essentially a representative of the Jewish people at large, he wears these garments, what's he reminding himself and what's he reminding the Jewish people about? He's reminding us of our exalted status. We are the princes of God. We are holy. God has an individual relationship with us. We're lofty. We're a kingdom of priests. We're a holy nation. We're God's chosen people. The only reason why we sin is because sometimes, tragically, we forget that. When the high priest wears the garments that remind us that we're really kingly, we are part of this spiritual monarchy, we're the princes of God, that in itself is a reason to undo sin because if we realized that ahead of time, we wouldn't have even sinned. There's a famous teaching in the Talmud about two children who were the sons, the son and daughter of Rabbi Yishmael, who was the last high priest of our nation. And this is when the temple was destroyed and they were taken into captivity and they were encouraged to do vile sins. And each one of them said to themselves, I'm a child of the high priest. I can do that. I can behave in that way. And it's a very dramatic story, but I think this is the lesson. The high priest, he is the ultimate embodiment of the fact that this is what our nation is. We are kings, all of us. We're a kingdom of priests and holy nation, not just the priests themselves, but everyone. If we realize that, we wouldn't sin. And therefore, when we do realize that, that in itself provides atonement because atonement is provided when conditions are set into place that would have prevented the sin from even happening. Like the Talmud tells us that there's three people who have their sins atoned for, and one of them, someone who is nominated for a position of high stature. When you are a position of high stature, you start behaving like that, you won't sin. The high priest reminds us that we are really that nation, that people, and therefore that provides atonement. So the first of the eight vestments that we're going to read about is the aphod, and that's like an apron-like garment. It's open in the front. It's closed in the back. It has two sets of straps, one of them that's waist-high, that's tied up like a belt, and two of them coming out from the back like somewhat like suspenders and coming over the shoulders, not going all the way down. But at the point where they are on their shoulders, and this is, of course, something just better to see a picture, but at that point, they have two stones called the Shoham stones. They're going to be inlaid in golden frames, and they're going to be connected to the next one of the vestments, the Choshen, the breastplate. They're going to connect to it via a chain of gold. So these of the first two of the vestments we're going to read about are going to be connected because the Choshen, which is the breastplate, is going to be connected and on its four corners, it's it's square, on its four corners is going to be linked to the aphod, to the apron-like garment that is the first one that we're described. And like I said, it's, it's great if you could get a picture of this to see what it looks like. Now, each one of these strings that are going to be made uh, into uh, woven into the aphod is each string is comprised of one strand of gold and then six strands of either blue wool or scarlet wool or purple wool and then that gives us a total of 28 strands six plus one six plus one so that's seven times four and that's going to create a 28 strand yarn that's going to be used to make this garment. And again, like we had last week with the covers of the tabernacle, it's going to be woven in a way that it's going to display different images on either side. Now, it is interesting that the Talmud tells us that the aphod atones 
for sins. Which sin does the ephod atone for? The sin of idolatry. Maybe the answer of why the ephod corresponds to idolatry is that the shoham stones, they sit on the shoulders and they kind of look like a yoke. You have these two straps that rest on the shoulders followed by these stones. We know the one prayer that testifies against idolatry is the prayer of the Shema. We say Hashem Echad, God is one. There's no other powers. Says the Talmud, what does that mean? That means that we're accepting upon ourselves the yoke of heaven. Perhaps the implicit imagery being conveyed in the ephod is the fact that we're accepting upon ourselves or the, the high priest is representing, is, is, is exhibiting the yoke of heaven and therefore that counteracts accepting any alternatives to that. On these two stones, so there's one stone on the right shoulder, one stone on the left shoulder, you have engraved the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. This is uh, going to be listed in the order that they were born, the 12 sons of Jacob. And Rashi tells us, interestingly, that if you count up the letters of all the names on one side and on the other side, each side equals a 25. And the idea behind that, the verse tells us in verse 12, you shall place both stones on the shoulder straps of the ephod, remembrance stones for the sons of Israel. Aaron shall carry their names before Hashem on both of his shoulders as a remembrance. Says Rashi, what does that mean? When God sees, so to speak, the 12 tribes, the 12 sons of Jacob on the shoulders of the high priest, that is going to evoke a remembrance of their piety, of their righteousness, and hopefully earn their children, their descendants, expiation, atonement, and forgiveness. The next one of the vestments that we're instructed to create is the Choshen Mishpat, the breastplate of judgment. And this is created with the same material as the ephod. It's essentially a square plate that goes on his, on his chest. It's going to be folded. So the back flap, there's going to be a back flap that's folded over uh, on, on the back side. And it's going to rest on the chest of Aaron, the high priest. And it's going to have, on the front side of it, stone mountings, uh, 12 of them, four rows of three. And the Torah tells us all 12, what, what kind of a precious gem they have to be. And on the stones are going to be engraved the names of the children of Israel. Now, it's important to stress, even though this is, again, the 12 sons of Jacob, there is a difference between the Shoham stones and the Miluim stones, the Shoham stones that were on the shoulders, two of them on connected to the ephod versus the 12 separate stones on the Choshen, in that on the ephod, it's going to have the names of the sons of Jacob, the individuals, whereas on the Choshen, it's not referring to the individual, the 12 sons of Jacob, rather to the tribes of Israel, to the nation of Israel, to the 12 tribes that were spawned from the 12 sons of Jacob to invoke their needs before God. Now, there is some backstory as to why Aaron merited to have this Choshen, this amazing vestment. Back in that same episode that we talked about a little bit earlier, where Moses, where Moshe was scared that Aaron will be upset, that Aaron will be envious over the fact that he's only the Jewish people out of Egypt, God tells Moshe, Vira'acha, he will see you, Aaron will see you, v'samach belibo, and he'll be happy, he'll be glad, he'll be joyous in his heart. Don't think that he's going to be envious of the fact that you're going to be the leader, He's going to be happy, not just happy externally, he's going to be happy in his heart. And Rashi con- concludes from our sages, this is why Aaron merited to have the Choshen on his heart because his heart was joyous, was glad with the success of someone else. Therefore, he is someone who earns, so to speak, the spiritual merit to have the Choshen on his heart, on his chest. Now, it's interesting. When the Talmud lists the various sins that each one of the vestments atones for, it tells us that the Choshen HaMishpat, the breastplate of judgment, atones for corruption of judgment. I find it really fascinating that Aaron was the one who we're told in our, sa- our sages tell us he was the peacemaker. 
Whenever there was a scuffle, when people had a disagreement, they would come to Aaron and Aaron knew how to make peace. Why was Aaron so gifted as a peacemaker? Because he really was someone who was not envious of others. He was so happy. He was happy in his heart. He was invested in his heart for the betterment of other people. And here we see that when he had this characteristic, he didn't show envy towards his brother Moshe. But also as a result of that, he merited to earn the Choshen Mishpat, the breastplate of judgment. And this is the key to undoing the mistakes of judgment. What is a righteous judge? Someone who does not corrupt justice. He's someone who behaves like Aaron, who really wants to see others succeed in his heart. There is a certain link between the idea of peace that Aaron exhibited and the idea of righteous judgment that he would be someone that would be best equipped to meet out. Now, on this breastplate, you have the the four rows of three stones apiece, and on each one of those stones, it says the name of one of the tribes of Israel. It says the Talmud in the book of Yoma, page 73b. Not only does it tell us the names of one of the sons, but it also tells us the words Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, and the words Shivte Yishurun, the, the tribes of God. And the Talmud explains that each one of those stones had six letters. And therefore, the, like, for example, the word Ruvain, which is the first son of Jacob, has only five letters. So therefore, there's room for one more letter. So the first letter of the name of Abraham, Avraham, is Aleph. So it says Ruvain plus an Aleph. And then Shimon is also five letters. So if Shimon plus a base, which is the next letter of the word Abraham. The word Levi only has three letters. So therefore, to make up for a total of six letters, you have three more letters. And that's the Resh, the He, the Mem, to make up the word Abraham. And so on. You have Yitzchak, and then Yaakov, and then Shifte Yeshurun. And in fact, the only one of the sons of Jacob that has a six-letter name, that's Benjamin. And therefore, the grand total, interestingly, is 72, because 12 times 6, 12 stones times 6 letters a piece on each one of those stones, is 72. Now, that number is going to appear several other times with relation to the Choshen. And our sages tell us that we know God has multiple names that he's called in the Torah, but we also know there's a name of God that corresponds to 72 letters, and our sages tell us that the 72 letters on the breastplate, it etched in, engraved into the precious gems of the breastplate, they correspond to the 72 name of God. Now, the breastplate is affixed, like we said earlier, onto the aphode. It's attached on top and it's attached on bottom until it sits nicely and snugly. It's not going to move around too much on from his chest. And then verse 30, we read, into the breastplate of judgment, you shall place the Urim and the Tumim, and they shall be on Aaron's heart when he comes before Hashem. Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel on his heart constantly before Hashem. So what is this Urim and, Tur- and Tumim that go inside the breastplate of judgment inside the Choshen? So Rashi tells us that this is the name of God, the ineffable name of God. You would place, like we said earlier, there was a flap, there was a back flap of the Choshen. Inside that flap, you place a document or some sort of hide that has upon it the name of God, the ineffable name of God. And that gives the Choshen prophetic powers, as we shall see. So Rashi seems to understand that it is the four-letter ineffable name of God. Others, including the Balaturim, tell us that no, it wasn't the four-letter name of God. Rather, it is the 72-letter name of God. And Ramban has an entire essay on this subject, and he begins with an argument that he poses with Ibn Ezra. The Ibn Ezra says it's, it's made out of silver, it's made out of gold. Ramban says no. He says, well, the Torah is very mysterious about this. It just says you put the Urim and Tumim in there. It's implied from the words of the Torah that you didn't make it. This was extant already. And what it is exactly, it's a hidden mystery. It was given to Moses straight from God, and he wrote it, and nobody knows where it came from or what it was was really about. But then the Ramban adds how it worked. 
essentially this was a, an alternative to prophecy. There's different levels of prophecy. There's the red prophecy, and then there's much lower levels of prophecy, but there's an intermediary level of prophecy done via the Urim and Tumim. And that is when a king or when the public has a dilemma, they go and they approach the high priest. They actually face the high priest's back. He doesn't see them. And they whisper the question in a way that only they hear it, but the high priest doesn't hear it. And various letters from those 72 letters that are etched onto the stones of the Choshen would start lighting up. And the high priest on this low level of prophecy would be able to not only understand the question, but also be able to understand from which letter is illuminated what the answer would be. And the commentaries here tell us that there's really two parts. There's the Urim and the Tumim. It, there's the illumination of the letters. And then there is the prophet, so to speak, himself decrypting the message and understanding how to put the letters together to be able to understand the message. So, for example, the first time this was used in history is in the first chapter of the book of Judges. The question is, who is going to conquer various parts of the Canaanite nation that are unconquered? And they went and they asked the high priest. The high priest used this Urim Vetumim that's inside the Choshen, inside the breastplate, and they got out the letters Yehuda, the tribe of Judah, and Yale, Judah will ascend. And they had to decrypt it to not bring out a different message. Rather, that's part, that's the part that's in the hands of the high priest on this low level of prophecy to be able to understand exactly what the message is and how to assemble the message from the letters that are illuminated. Really interesting. But once the first temple was destroyed, we no longer had the Ark of last week. And in addition, we no longer had the Urim and Tumim. We, never had, we no longer had that level of prophecy. The next garment we read about is the robe of the ephod, the Me'il ephod, And this is made entirely out of trellis, out of turquoise wool. And there's a dispute exactly what the, how it looked exactly. But essentially, it's like a, it, it's a robe. And on the bottom of the robe, there were bells and pomegranates. And it's a discussion amongst the commentaries. Uh, Rashi says there were golden bells that had ringers inside of them alongside pomegranates of wool, but side by side. So a gold bell and then next to it was a pomegranate. The Ramban argues, says no, the bells were inside the pomegranates. And they quote the Talmud that uh, it doesn't say in the Torah exactly how many bells and pomegranates, but the Talmud tells us that is, again, 72 of them, 36 on each side. And... The description of this vestment is that it must be on Aaron in order to minister. Its sound shall be heard when he enters the sanctuary before Hashem and when he leaves so that he does not die. Rashi tells us, and all the sages talk about this, that if Aaron were to not be wearing the proper vestments when he walks into the sanctuary, when he walks into the tabernacle, this will be a reason for him to indeed die. So it says that he wears them and he doesn't die, but it is implied from that if he does not wear that, then that is indeed an offense that is worthy of capital punishment. Why did Aaron have to have bells on the bottom of the me'il, on the bottom of this robe announcing his arrival? So some of the commentaries tell us that it's it's improper to barge into a king's presence unannounced. You have to announce yourself, and therefore, if, if you're if God is dwelling in the Mishnah, the tabernacle. Aaron has to announce himself before he barges in, otherwise it's improper. Alternatively, uh, there may be for us a very, very valuable lesson as parents and as educators, and that is that, you know, we shouldn't try to catch people who are our underlings, be it our students, our, our, our children. We shouldn't try to catch them making mistakes. We should make sure that we don't barge into their room. We don't want to have us pounce on them. It's a very valuable technique to knock on their door and to not try to catch them in a negative light to allow them to prepare themselves before you arrive. And just like you can imagine, you have the holiest person of the Jewish nation, the high priest, Aaron, and he's around them. Whenever he comes, everyone stiffens up, you know. In the tabernacle, there's a lot of meat, as we shall soon see. People are eating, and what's going to be? The high priest rolls in, and if he comes unannounced, everyone, everyone's freaking out. But when you hear the bells, 
you hear the pinging of the of the bells and the pomegranates, you know that the high priest is about to come and you could prepare yourself and you're not going to be scared and it's not going to be an uncomfortable experience for the underlings of Aaron, the high priest. Says the Talmud in addition, this robe provides atonement for Lashon Hara, for evil talk. Why? This makes noise and therefore it will atone for someone who makes noise in a negative way. And in fact, there's no one better than Aaron to provide atonement for gossip. But like we said, he is someone who had no envy, who was always in- invested in someone else's betterment. And therefore, he's someone who is the proper person to provide atonement for that kind of misdeed. The next one of the vestments we read about is the tzitz, which is a plate, a head plate that goes on his forehead. It's connected by straps made out of treles. On it, it says, Kodesh Lashem, holy to Hashem. That was worn on the forehead. Then there is a tunic as well. And then we read about the vestments for the ordinary Kohanim. Uh, They have four out of the eight given to the high priest. Chapter 29 is going to talk about the various rituals and processes that we need to do. Once the Mishkan, once the tabernacle is complete, once all its vessels have been constructed, once all the garments of the high priest are ready to go, once everything is ready, there's going to be a week-long ceremony, and the process that's described in chapter 29 is going to be done every single day of that week, and that's the week in which Moshe is going to act as the high priest, and those are going to be his last days as the high priest, and at the end, he's going to transfer, give over the keys, so to speak, to Aaron and Aaron's children. He's going to be demoted back to a regular Levite, and Aaron's going to be promoted to a Kohen, to a priest, to the high priest. So what do you need to do on the days of inauguration? This is the matter you shall do for them to sanctify them in order to minister for me. You take one bull and two rams that are unblemished, various other breads and loaves and and oil, and you're going to bring them in, you're going to offer them as a sacrifice uh, to God in the newly constructed tabernacle. In addition, we read about, very interesting, in in verse 7, you take the anointment oil. There's a special oil that we're going to read about in Etrus Parsha. It's going to be made only once. In fact, it's prohibited to be used for any non-sacred purpose. It's going to be used to anoint all the vessels of the Mishkan and the high priest, and in fact, future kings, unless the king, the new king, is the son of a previous king. And the Talmud, in the book of Horius 11b, tells us that this was a miracle in the fact that it never ran out. For centuries, the same jug of oil that was concocted by Moses, it was used for every subsequent king and high priest. And in fact, we're not allowed to replicate it. It was kept for posterity in the Holy of Holies next to the Ark. And when the first temple was destroyed, it was hidden along with a lot of the other things, uh, like we spoke about last week, the Ark, Aaron's staff, the vial of manna, and so on. So we have the bull. The bull's be offered as a sacrifice. Rashi tells us, interestingly for the timeline, that the bull is, of course, from the same species as the golden calf. And chronologically, even though we haven't read about the golden calf, that's going to be the major episode of next week's Parsha. But the golden calf is the calf that matures into a bull, and therefore you bring a bull as an offering to atone for the sin of the golden calf. And then we slaughter the ram, and its blood is thrown onto the altar corners. There's one ram, then the second ram has its blood placed on three places on the body of each of the Kohanim. You take the blood, you put on the right earlobe, the right thumb, and the right big toe. It's a very strange-sounding ceremony for us. The commentaries explain that these there's a lot of meaning behind this, why this is done. For example, Rav Hirsch tells us, that the air is is used for hearing and understanding. You act through the hands and through the feet you move about. And this kind of encompasses many of the aspects of life as a human. And the Kohen is being dedicated and consecrated to use all of that for the service of God. After you use the blood of the second ram to place upon the bodies of the Kohanim, you sprinkle it on the altar and then you sprinkle it on Aaron, together with some of the anointment oil on Aaron, not just Aaron, but on Aaron's sons, and on their vestments. So this is the process of consecration of Aaron, and of the entire tabernacle, and of these vestments that are to be constructed 
to be used by the priests in the tabernacle. And then we read about another process that was done during this week. Moshe, again, is acting as the high priest. He's going to be taking part of these sacrifices, part of these offerings. There's going to be a waving ceremony, waving in all directions to demonstrate God's dominion over all. Then they're going to be offered on the altar. We also read about what happens when the passing of the guard happens, when is the, the high priest, let's say, dies. And then the next priest who's going to take his place, they're nominated by the king together with the consensus of the fellow priests. And they also have to have seven days of inauguration before they become the fully fledged high priest. And interestingly, we're told here, Rashi tells us that, again, it's describing the inauguration of Aaron for the first time, but this same procedure is going to be used in subsequent times when the next high priest is going to be inaugurated. And it tells us that you take from Aaron's sons. And the idea behind this, Rashi tells us, is that, you know, when the previous high priest dies, you have to find a successor. It's always good to find one of his sons. If they were qualified, they should be the one who inherit, who succeed the father if they are qualified. General good rule, if the previous leader passes and their child is worthy, even though there's someone else who may be slightly more worthy, but they get first dibs at that. That's what the Torah tells us. So this process is repeated for seven days. Again, we have the three sacrifices plus all the other offerings plus this whole waving ceremony. And again, we're going to read about the implementation of this. This is just the instruction, but we're going to read about the implementation of this uh, sometime soon. Now, in verse 38 of chapter 29, we read about the daily Tamid offerings. The word Tamid means ongoing, ceaseless. And these are the two offerings brought in the tabernacle and then subsequently in the temple, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, and we'll read about it over here. This is unrelated to the ceremonies and the rituals of the inauguration. This was the daily activities in the temple and in the tabernacle. Its relevance to our narrative, the commentaries tell us, that even during the week of the inauguration, before the Mishkan, before the tabernacle was fully consecrated, it was still done by Moshe. He was still acting in his capacities as, as the interim Kohen Gadol, as the interim high priest, and this was still done during that week. Don't think that you wait until after that week, until the tabernacle is fully ready to go to start the daily Tamid offerings, the sheep, one sheep in the morning and one sheep in the evening. Incidentally, we do get a description of, of, of this procedure, this daily procedure, this twice daily procedure down the temple was pretty dramatic. There was music and the, the Levites were singing and there was a different song for every day and everyone who was there was bowing down. Even if someone was a king, they would bow down. It was accompanied by trumpets, a very dramatic and very festive activity that happened in the temple every day, multiple times. And this continued for many, many centuries. Now, when the Torah concludes the description of this twice daily sacrifice, it tells us in verse 42, as a continual elevation offering for your generations at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So this is at the entrance of the Mishkan, which is what we spoke about last week, the outer altar before Hashem, where I shall set my meeting with you to speak to you there. Rashi points out that last week we were under the impression that God speaks to Moses inside the Holy of Holies by the Ark. And here there is a suggestion of a second location where God speaks to Moses at the outer altar where the sacrifices are burned. Now, I think this is maybe an appropriate place to talk about sacrifices in general. Again, we're going to get more into it when we talk about it in Leviticus. But here we see that there's certain significance to sacrifices leading to prophecy. And the idea behind that is a sacrifice is you're slaughtering an animal. And the one of the themes behind that is you're trying to negate your own animal that you have within you, your own physicality, your own inherent body, and by doing that, exposing your dormant soul. What does it mean to have prophecy? What did Moses do to earn the rights to speak to God? He went through this sacrificial process, so to speak. He negated he minimized, he mitigated his physical, his inherent body, his inherent animal. He sacrificed his body, so to speak, and thereby was able to communicate with God via his, what was previously dormant soul. 
And verse 43 we read, I shall set my meaning there with the children of Israel and, and it shall be sanctified with my glory. Rashi tells us, again, in concluding the description of the inauguration week, it's going to be sanctified with my glory. Says Rashi, there's an ominous hint towards God becoming exalted through those that are close to him. This plays out better in Hebrew, but the word in Hebrew is bichvodi, but it could be read bichvodai, which means not with my glory, but rather with those who glorify me. God has become exalted via the people who are close to him. And this is a hint towards a very shocking and very tragic event that's going to happen during this week of inauguration, and that's the death of the sons of Aaron. And later on, we're going to read, again, this is more the subject of the stories ahead of us, but we're going to read that Moshe picked up on this in verse 43, he picked up that God is hinted towards him that there's going to be a certain exaltation of God via the death of Nadav and Avihu. And in fact, later on, we find out that Moshe thought that he himself and or Aaron are going to be the ones who died. And then when he comforts Aaron over the death of his sons, he says, well, I see that your sons are even greater than me. And finally, concluding the chapter, I shall sanctify the hint of meaning and the altar, and Aaron and his sons shall sanctify to minister for me. And we're coming full circle. The beginning of last week's parish, we read that God proposed he is going to dwell amongst the Jewish people. And in conclusion, I shall rest my presence amongst the children of Israel, and I shall be their God. They shall know that I am Hashem, their God, who took them out of the land of Egypt to rest my presence among them. I am Hashem, their God. If you follow all these instructions, the instructions of creating, constructing the temple, the tabernacle, of building, assembling, organizing, weaving, constructing the vestments, of going through this week, this process of inauguration, God's promising, I shall dwell amongst you. Just briefly, there's a very interesting Rashi here in verse 46. If you read the verse, they shall know that I am Hashem who took them out of the land of Egypt to rest my presence among them. A very short Rashi. Says Rashi, the purpose of the Exodus is in order to dwell amongst them, in order to have this close relationship, in order to have the tabernacle and everything that it represents. That's why God took us out of Egypt, not merely as a way to avoid the pain of servitude, but in order to create the positive of having this close relationship, have God, having God dwell amongst us. The parsha concludes in chapter 30, with an instruction to make a second altar. This is called the inner altar or the golden altar or the altar of incense. And that is an altar that goes in the tabernacle. So it's somewhat confusing because there's a very large and bronze plated outer altar upon which sacrifices are offered and burned. And then there's an inner altar, which is inside the tabernacle that's made out of gold, and there it's not sacrifices that are burned, rather it's incense that is burned twice daily. Now, all the commentaries talk about why the golden altar was not instructed last week. After all, last week, we had the instructions of all the vessels of the tabernacle. Uh, we had the, the ark and the shulchan, on the table, and uh, the outer altar, and the menorah, and everything related to the vessels in the tabernacle. This week, we seem to be having instructions of the individuals, the, the priests and their clothing. And then we go back all the way at the end of the Parsha, chapter 30, to the instructions of how to build the incense altar. So everyone offers uh, various interpretations. I want to share the idea of the Sephora, a very deep idea. I'm not quite sure I get it myself. But he says that there are two objectives in the Mishkan thus far. There is the idea of God's presence dwelling amongst us, and that's fulfilled by the tabernacle and its vessels. And then there's the idea of God's glory appearing in the tabernacle, and that's fulfilled by the sacrifices. And here, where it's talking about the incense offering on the altar, the golden altar, the inner altar, the incense altar, here there's a third objective that's going to be fulfilled, and that's not about God's presence or about God's glory, but rather it's 
from our perspective, how we approach, how we greet, so to speak, God's glory and God's presence, that is done via the incense. And then he hints the fact that this is a very complicated thing. It's a very subtle thing. In fact, the Talmud tells us in the book of, of Shabbos that uh, there was a secret that was conveyed to Moses when he was in heaven but to him by the angels. They told him a secret, and that relates to the the incense. So it's it's something that we'll probably still talk about uh, a little bit later on. Uh, twice a day, there's daily offerings of incense. This is corresponding to the twice daily menorah activities. In the morning, the menorah is cleaned out, and there's one offering of incense. In the evening, the menorah is kindled, and that's a second offering of incense. And the last verse of the Parsha, we read, that there is once a year that something other than incense is offered upon this golden altar, and that is on Yom Kippur, Aaron shall bring atonement upon its horns once a year from the blood of the sin offerings of the atonements once a year on Yom Kippur, something other than incense is offering blood from a sacrifice. In next week's Parsha, we're going to wrap up some of the instructions related to the tabernacle, and then we're going to resume the narrative at the foot of the mountain. Moshe is up in heaven for 40 days and 40 nights. And like we said, this chronologically happened prior to the this parsha and the preceding parsha. Moshe is going to come down and he's going to find the Jewish people worshiping the golden calf or some small portion of the Jewish people worshiping the golden calf. And a lot of events are going to ensue from that as we shall see.